Uh, you're coming in loud and clear, me. How are you doing today? I'm all right. Yes, it's it's a very uh, dreary January dr day here in London. I've still got the last bits of my Christmas decorations up, so I'm trying to uh, hold on to uh, festive cheer <laughs> amidst the, the darkness. Well, I see the nutcracker in the background, so it looks like you're keeping the Christmas going. Yeah, I, rec I reckon two more days, then I'm going to let it go. <laughs> All right, let's jump into it. So, you know, I enjoyed your film, very entertaining. So mm -hmm. let's start from the beginning, right? You know, I was unfamiliar with your work as a comedian as I read your Wikipedia page, right? So talk <laughs> about, you know, writing this film with your wife, from what I understand, where did the idea come from? Talk about that beginning process. Okay, so uh, yes, my wife and I are both uh, Luddites who are extremely paranoid about technology of any kind. Uh, do not have an Alexa in our house, do not have any smart lighting or smart heating. We are, we don't have a smart doorbell. We are very paranoid about our information and feeling that people are monitoring us and manipulating us. So we wanted to write something about that, basically. And we wanted to, so but we both grew up with sort of the, the you know, store, the great stalker thrillers, like we'd watch those on sleepovers and things, not not together, you know, that would that would have been weird. Um, we didn't meet till a lot later on. Uh, uh, and uh, yeah, we, we, you know, Basic Instinct and Fatal Attraction, or, you know, uh, Hand That rock, Rocks the Cradle, Single White Female, these kind of films. So we kind of wanted to do something, you know, it was the first thing we'd written together. We wanted to do something that brought both of these together really and we thought what is the ultimate stalker but an alexa so we basically decided to kind of create a humanoid alexa which became tim the te technologically integrated manservant and um yeah that's that was the heart of the film really the, the, the all right so oh, sorry so you know when, when you think about these like you know robots you know you hearken back to like terminator 2 and you know tim is like you just said like an alexa like a like a humanoid alexa in your home that 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 goes rogue and you know obviously you don't want something threatening in, in the in, in the house right but when you're talking about the production design of the robot like i was thinking of something like data i saw the film cold but then when you see amen you know he's tall he's good looking talk about casting that body type and why did you go for that specific look for tim well, we, I guess we wanted him to be, why did we go for that specific look? Okay, that's interesting. Well, really, I think it's, you know, like when we when we saw Eamon, that he, you know, that sort of guided us really, because we 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 had the, I got, I got like a sort of actor drop from our casting uh, director and he was there right at the bottom of the list. Like, no, well, not, not the, but it wasn't, it wasn't ranked. He just happened to be, <laughs> it wasn't like, but you won't want this guy. Uh, no, it was just, he was there like down the list somewhere and, and we spotted him and he's just got such a great face because he's sort of, he's, He's, he's he's obviously handsome, but at the same time, he's sort of uh, got an uncanny look, like he could be an elf or a sort of creature from another world or something, you know. And so we just we we just thought he'd be had such a great look for a robot, and we didn't have the budget to really, um, to, you know, to 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 sort of give him loads of bells and whistles. Not that I particularly wanted to, but so we needed someone that did have that sort of otherworldly look, really, and was a great actor. So that's so it was really, you know. I guess we would always probably go skinnier rather than uh, I, I, I guess skinny is efficient. That's that's the idea. If you're strong and skinny, you're efficient. And, you know, they've got a scene where uh, Mark, the husband in it. Um, so he, he plays Paul. He's I don't, know, I don't know if you remember, he's carrying a big bag of, bag of soil. And then Tim just comes up and lift, takes takes it off him, you know. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I think, again, that's more striking in a way when Mark is actually kind of, you know, he was in like The Last Kingdom. And, uh, you know, he's like he's in a BBC show about SAS guys. here. He's actually like pretty strong and pretty tough and he's got good muscles and stuff. And Eamon's this kind of quite slight little slender figure who can then just lift twice as much of him as him. Yeah, you know, another thing, you know, not to dwell too much on, on Tim's mannerisms, which I thought was interesting, is because, you know, Eamon's performance, he's a little bit robotic in some of the movements where you can see that he's not going to be like fluid human. But then when they, the scene where they watch the movie and you see his eyes getting watering and you get that first hint of, okay, there's something deeper going on inside this robot's brain, you can see that he's having more of a human, you know, connection, right? So was that purposely done where you're saying, okay, we're going to use this moment to be the point where the audience can see that he's not just a machine? yeah i think that that was probably probably the the moment where 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 we start to empathize a bit with him and start to you know start to sympathize with his his character but also we we also wanted the whole film to mirror the you know abby's sort of 
you know acceptance of him as a as a human really and and you know the start i even played with the sound a bit where he made his sound effects the subtle sound effects of the star and by the end they're all gone because we're seeing it even though it's you know it's not through abby's eyes it's her through her point of view and she's come to accept him and, and i wanted that to mirror the way that we all sort of quickly forget that we've got this massive amount of computational power analyzing us on our computers. You know, you know, we're just like, oh, just just having to scroll through Google. You know, we're not thinking about it after a while about uh, about them trying to manipulate us or, or or scan us for data. You know, I'm gonna get back to that point uh, towards the end of the, the interview because I really want to get your opinion on something. But let's talk about about Abby's. <laughs> Don't worry, it's as good. Uh, this is good stuff. I really want to talk about Abby and uh, Georgina Campbell because okay. she's a phenomenal actress. I first saw her in Barbarian. I thought yeah. she was great. And in this role, you know, she's not naive, but she's not willing to put that to bridge that gap between. Okay, you know, I'm an engineer. And I know what a computer can do. And my husband's trying to tell me something, but you can't see it until it's too late. So talk about getting that performance from her and how much time you guys had to like, you know, get together and basically research and, and practice. Well, we all we always um we always wanted her to be a different kind of scientist. You know, that's why we made her a prosthetic scientist. So even though she's she's great at the physical stuff and can, you know, who can make these these circuits work, she's not an AI scientist. So that th this is still. You know, I think she has a, a natural love of science, the character, but at the same time, she's, um, she's, uh, you know, so she has a fascination with what's happening with him, but but at the same time, she isn't, um, you know, she isn't aware of the inner workings of it. So she's sort of both inside and outside, really. But I think with with Georgina, she's just so she's she's a very instinctive actor to work with. I think she's she reads the script. She's a she's a big reader as well. She reads all the time, and uh, she's uh, she, I think she just sort of got where 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 it was and she's she seems to internalize things very very quickly and uh comes so prepared to set and there's very you know there's not a lot of you know pushing to you know to do with georgina <laughs> you know she just uh she just kind of you know just came came to it very fully fully formed and i and we knew kind of what she how how great she was and how subtle she is with her face and the fact that she's so real you know we, we wanted you know, when we saw her, when we cast her, that's what we, ho we were hoping she'd bring to the role, and and she did. I think you know that cliche about you know ninety percent of directing is casting with with actors. I think I think it's a big bigger truth to it. You know the the scenes. I mean, everything basically takes place inside the house, and there's a lot of good staging and blocking back and forth. They're going up and down the stairs. They're in the room. They're in the garage. So, how much was that done practically in that setting, or was it all basically on sets? no sets for the whole film no so we basically we knew when we conceived of the film we had you know it was the first it was the first film we were we you know we sarah and i had written my wife and i had written and um and it was the first film i was going to be directing as a feature so so i knew it had to be sort of cheapish so we we basically wrote a three-hander in one location <laughs> and then we searched around and and had to sort of you know, do, you know, made you know, do it in this in this real house, basically. And we were hoping that you know that that it would feel more expansive than that. And I think it sort of does. So in in many ways, you know. But we haven't. We did that with four weeks filming. We shot three in the house, basically. And uh, and there were certain things wrong with it, so we had to change the script around for, to suit those. And again, like I remember, even just before we were shooting, I was going, "Have we got too many? Have we got too many scenes in the hall? I think we got too many scenes in the hall." You know, just trying to make sure that we had that sort of varied palette and varied sort of you know sense of space and background so that it never felt repetitive and like we were just walking into the same room again but the house was was big but at the same time we you know a lot of the rooms we weren't allowed to use there was stuff pushed in them from the people whose house it was and things and, and so so we didn't you know it was mainly the downstairs the hallway the the garden the um the, and, and this main sort of uh kitchen diner living area uh so that we did it in really so yeah it was a case of just always trying to constantly keep that textured and keeping keeping it feel like we were moving to new places and also trying to avoid reflections because there was so much glass in the house as soon as we turned the lights off uh -huh. it was just like oh ah. but hey 
you know, one of the things I was thinking about the the blocking in particular was there's almost like a Hitchcockian element to it, you know, because Tim is not like, you know, the aforementioned Terminator that I was saying before. He's in the house. He's supposed to be basically a product, but he's basically popping up. He's behind you. He's he's around you. He's always in the area. And there was yeah. a lot of like movement with the camera where you see them like, oh, shit, he's right behind me. You know what yeah. I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Was like a was there something specifically like a film or a TV show that informed that for you, that process? No, I, I, I'm a big believer in like, Hitchcock uh, is, a, is a great influence and a big believer in suspense, you know, as being that you rather than just surprise. And I think we're in an era of surprise in films where it's just like, and this happens and this happens, you know, and it's just like, and even so I, I wanted the, the really, I wanted this to be a suspense film where you know that there's a ticking time bomb. And it's about to go off. And, and again, just having him constantly present. And, you know, yeah, we were very, very, very aware of the uh, of, of the blocking and, you know, just little little, little reveals and, you know, sort of ha having him in certain spaces in the background and, you know, things like that. So, yeah, that was very, very, very much on our minds. All right. So here, here's a cheesy question I always ask, but I love hearing the responses. And I think for you, you know, in your feature debut, this might be an interesting answer. So what for you was the best and worst day as director and co-writer of Tim? <laughs> uh, um, probably the worst day was when we um, were doing a big finale sequence and didn't quite factor in how long it would take to uh, sort out various uh, special effects. Uh, the prep for them, such as um, the harnesses and, you know, like prosthetics and things. And so we basically ran out of time after about <laughs> two thirds of the stuff we needed to film and then um, did miraculously managed to shoot um, part of the finale uh, with two cameras at the same same time, which uh, I'm, you know, abandoned storyboards from me. It was just like, how do we get this done otherwise we don't have a film and the it was very it was quite funny because the uh the the, the first ad T ty hack who's brilliant he had um we had that we had a knife and he had to we had a fake knife and he had to i'm not saying who's 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 using it I'm, no spoilers here maybe she's maybe she's cut she's eating a meal the main character was eating a meal with a knife and a fake knife and he so he would because we didn't have time to do different takes with these things we would have to pause the take and then he would bring in the new life knife and the actors would continue and <laughs> pause and bring in the other knife and say so things like that. That was probably the uh that was probably the low point of the film. <laughs> but at the same time, you know, to be honest, the whole thing was was uh, was just a great experience for me. And it's just I'm, you know, I'm so pleased I got to make a film. So really I'm just feel like a kid in a kid in a toy shop. I just feel, you know, so privileged to be you know, be able to do it really because it's so many people want to and so few people get to so so i you know the whole the whole thing is for me is a sort of high point all right so you know there there's multiple tims in the story because tim is a product like alexa and you know you have the, the douchey elon musk type millionaire you know the, the, that kind of guy and yeah. so do we see other stories in the timverse you know do you see like another way to go with this if i can let's, ask that question Let's see uh, how successful it is in the uh, <laughs> in the US. See if, see if it justifies a, a, a sequel with 10 times the budget. Um, you know, I haven't really, you know, been thinking, you know, I have I have theories about what happened at the end of things. And I, I think, you know, it's uh, really, it was so about this this one thing, about this, um, you know, big data that we didn't really, weren't really thinking about, you know, kind of continuing the character, but, um, who knows? Maybe, maybe something will strike us in a couple of years. Good stuff. All right. So let's get to the the, the serious thought provoking question that I've been dying to ask you. Okay. This, this, is, this, right? is, this is this is the suspense. No surprise. This is, this is the this 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 is the gritty stuff, right? So so okay. basically, when I was watching the film, I had literally just read this article about a Tesla robot arm that it, it didn't attack, but it malfunctioned in a way, and it really it pinned the engineer that was working on it, and it hurt the guy, and he fell down some shooter or whatever. And of course, this happened a couple of years ago. And Elon Musk was just forced to reveal that it happened, right? And so, you know, that the Abby character works on the arms, <laughs> you know, specifically to make it better. That's her goal as part of this company. And I was like, shit, you know, this is very prescient to what's happening now. We've all seen like, you know, Terminator. We understand Skynet. But I'm with you. I'm, I'm anti-Alexa. I'll, I'll turn on my own lights. Thank you. But this speaks to a bigger problem where, okay, these products, once they become, you know, more tactile and involved in human, you know, spheres, 
what if they malfunction? It might not be like, you know, like complete, you know, malfeasance, like, oh, I'm going to turn psycho and kill you. But like, what if the robot that's making your coffee all of a sudden decides to, to stab you with the coffee cup instead? You know, in this era, I think people look at us and say, well, that's a little bit overreacting. But I think that's very legitimate. What do you think of that? It's um, what well, one thing we wanted to have in the film was was it being sort of rushed out. I mean, you know, you know, she, uh, Juice and the characters always talking about trying to beat the Chinese to market, and and I think that's just it's just the rea the reality of it really. It's you know, it's like the the thing the Oppenheimer thing that they didn't know when they pressed that button if it would destroy the the world. You know, they were there was a slight fear that it might, and they still did it, and. Um, I think that's the that's the trouble. We're so curious as a species that we just want to do things no matter what the consequences. And uh, and you know, one the one thing that was quite nice was uh, my uh, you know our agent's assistant was um was was described as the Terminator but domestic when she saw the film. <laughs> but it's like it's it's but I think that's kind of quite nice in a way the fact that it's um. It, it, we do allow these things into our houses and we're not going to take the proper precautions, you know, but hey, ho hopefully, hopefully society will wise up and, uh, you know, and actually be careful with this with stuff. But, you know, that's quite worrying about the uh, the, the arm. <laughs> you may be more paranoid than my own film has. I mean, literally, it was the thing that popped into my head when I saw her manipulating the arm with the egg. Yeah. And so one, one last question on this, you know, more and more specific. So when this point of the singularity does happen, which it will, when the AI, you know, achieves consciousness and, you know, I mean, are, are we doomed for humanity? I mean, is it really going to be a thing where it's like, well, you know, you guys deserve to all die because I'm better? Or is there a possibility that it might actually be better and help us all? What do you think? Um I personally, I don't believe in the singularity. I don't believe AI can become conscious. Um, I think that's really just, why, why not? I'm curious because why would it? Why, I think consciousness is something that's developed organically, you know, and it's a mystery how it's appeared. And I just don't think if you if you take microchips on a very basic level as being physical objects in space and you know electrical currents doing things, no matter how many you put together or how complex they get, there's no reason it should form consciousness any more than sort of pebbles rolling down a beach in my head it's just it's you know it's just a complex system and there's no reason why i should create that you know it may be that that is can consciousness can be created but i don't see it as being there's no reason something that appears to be human and appears to be conscious has more probability of becoming conscious than something that does doesn't a complex system that doesn't appear to be conscious so i'm not i'm not too worried about the sing singularity per se but i am worried about um you know, and I didn't really want Tim to be too much about about consciousness, really. You know, this is there is a little hint of it, but it's really about how we treat technology and how we accept it and how we come to see it as human, even though it's 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 not. So I think I think the danger really is is not necessarily it becoming conscious and having goals different to our own. It's that somehow the, the way we program it. Or, or someone else, you know, someone else's goals, another human's goals, <laughs> create create these these problems. So, so yeah, I, I, it's for me, it's less a lesser mystical thing of an otherworldly being creating things. There's more just mal malfunction and uh, lack of understanding of complex systems. But hey, that's less fun, isn't it? No, no, that, that's that's a great answer. I, I see your point of view. All right, so they're probably going to pull me away because I got to do the, the next interview with the cast. But um, one quick question about your future. You've made a film. You've got it in the bag. It, it's coming out. What's next for Spencer Brown? What do you got on the docket? So I've got, we just we just finished a new sci-fi, so uh, which we're really uh, pleased with. So we just finished the script, script for that. And then I'm sort of working on a new um, film. I'm, I'm kind of now feeling I'd like to try and do something that isn't set in a... In, in in buildings and you know and with technology so i might try and so i'm sort of working on a little uh horror set in in some woodland you know and have some organic uh matter <laughs> around me where i film where, where i film so th those are my two sort of projects that i'm working on at the moment and then I'd, I'd like to do a comedy at one point as well you know i've i've got such i've got a history in comedy and that's what that's been my life for many years and uh and though i have abandoned it it, it has not abandoned me and uh, I hope to, uh, you know, maybe one day do something funny too. Purely funny. Tim's a bit funny at times. Uh, that's uh, good stuff. You know, let me sneak one more question in. I mean, I, I really enjoyed the film and I, and I loved uh, the, the, the character interactions. And I can see like, you know, where your, where your process goes as a filmmaker, as far as, you know, these good human elements. What, what's out there that you like personally that you think is entertaining? Right now. 
right uh, now, if you can. Right, right now, I loved. Uh, I'm, I'm enjoying the new season of Fargo. The new season five of oh. Fargo is great. I've been, I've been like the last. I've been enjoying a lot of Korean cinema. You know, uh, that's that's. I'm really enjoying Korean cinema and Danish cinema. I'm um, mainstream wise. I just saw the May December, which I thought was excellent. Have you seen May December? I have. Yes. Well, that was great. I love May December. I haven't seen Saltburn yet. Uh, so I need to watch that. And then I've been watching some great, in the last few years, I've been watching some great French series as well. Like there's a series called The Bureau, which is a spy drama, but it's really sort of um, realistic and things. But, but I, I, I love a lot of old stuff as well. Like last night, I started watching Conan the Barbarian for the first time ever. <laughs> <laughs> I've never I just suddenly thought I've never seen Conan the Barbarian. I'm gonna watch that. So and wow. yeah, yeah, so I'm 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 doing it. But but I but I just I love a lot of you know, most of my favorite filmmakers are, are old, you know, filmmakers from the past and stuff. So I watch a lot of old stuff too. But yeah, I think there is there is some great, great stuff uh around now. You just have to find it amidst the uh, less great stuff, let's say. Spencer, thank you for the time, mate. Appreciate the interview. And if you love Conan, you've got to see uh, Bridget Nielsen in uh, Red Sonia with Schwarzenegger. Okay, yes, <laughs> that, I'm aware of Red Sonia. I've never seen it. Okay. <laughs> oh, it's, a, yeah. it, it, it's, it's a must see. Okay. <laughs> All right. Okay. Thanks, Spencer. Cheers, mate. Nice to meet you. Take care. Bye.